Hello, everybody. Good morning. This is the last session, Your Holiness, on the last day of this year. So I think it is very auspicious. We have you with us, and we are really honored. Uh, we were going to have two speakers in this session, but unfortunately, one speaker, Geshe Thapke, has been uh, taken ill. So uh, we are left with just one speaker and a general discussion and a kind of a concluding you know, session with His Holiness. So may I now invite uh, Professor Sion Raman, who is from the University of Washington, Seattle, USA. He is going to make a presentation on the nature of mind from neuroscience and physics perspective. May I request you, sir, to make thank, your presentation? You. you have around 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very honored to be having an opportunity to present this talk in front of you. Uh, and also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Gokhale and uh, Professor Namang Santanla for giving me an opportunity to come here to present this talk. And today I'm going to talk about the nature of mind from the neuroscience and physics perspective and what we can learn from here. And the uh, outline of my talk consists of uh, uh, many topics, gross features of consciousness, mental consciousness, perception of time and how we can use EEG for research, and also looking into precognition and possible theories. So starting in a, in a very simple way, uh, neuroscience is very good by now that we can tell where different areas of the brain are which could be sort of uh, suggested that where the reading or speech or smell or hearing is. The picture which is in front of you uh, is uh, showing uh, from my life's, uh, left side is the front and this way is the back. Uh, and so there we can really classify uh, what part of the brain is responsible for these features. Now, uh, so in summary, what we can say is that uh, when it comes to gross features of the uh, brain slash mind, that uh, uh, smell, speech, sense of touch, we can define very precisely from the neuroscience point of view. Now, I'm just going to the next uh, summary slide. Where, uh, so when it comes to the senses, uh, I would say probably neuroscience and the Buddhist side will agree quite a lot. <clears throat> and many experiments can be performed to map all these uh, uh, gross features of consciousness. And uh, lately, now, uh, through more advanced techniques, now we can even <coughs> uh, study even w which part of the brain could show emotions and also color. I'm going to just use it in my hand. <laughs> so I, I can very easily uh, tell emotions like love, compassion, and even anger and fear, we can see which part of the brain respond. And these can be done, uh, techniques called EEG, as well as uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and these are very common now within the last 15 years, many uh, advances have been made. Now, oh. so, uh, so from, uh, so coming back to it, 
Now, when it comes to going to whether there is something more than these gross features of the consciousness, this is where majority of the neuroscientists will have problem. If we go further out, what we will say is that the consciousness or the one which has a capability of analyzing or thinking of emotions and those things, it emerges from uh, interactive behavior of bunch of neurons in the brain. And beyond that, uh, most of the neuroscientists uh, will not go. However, there are some neuroscience scientists beginning to say that uh, that may not be a complete picture of the consciousness. There could be something more than that. And uh, from the Buddhist side, we call it mental consciousness. Neuroscientists may not call it mental consciousness, but they might still say there is something more than just the gross features of the consciousness. So this is where majority of the neuroscience research is. However, when it comes to theorizing, uh, in neuroscience research, we are still trying to look for what generally we call it neural correlates of consciousness. Which simply means is, can I find the single neuron or just a set of neurons which could be characterized as representing one object? Now, so here, in this picture here, you are seeing a scene where there is a dog and a uh, tree and other things and their neurons are responding out of that can I pick up the sequence of neuron firing and particular neuron which can be related to a dog. A lot of work is going on in these types of research but still we have no answer. We cannot find a neuron which is related to a dog or a particular neuron related to a human being. And uh, this is where we are stuck at this moment. Uh, and, and I will give you my opinion. I don't think it will work because same neuron does many other things. Just like a screwdriver, you can use it to perform many, many things. So are the neurons this way. And uh, so where do we go from, from here? Nowadays, there are some other theories which uh, people talk about that uh, it may be related to information processing. So like when we have a bunch of uh, neurons, they create an information. So maybe information way might be another way to look at uh, uh, that this might be a consciousness. However, uh, that model itself has not produced any good tangible results. So we are sort of stuck here. Uh, even a lot of people have been challenged that like in case uh, uh, you, you can have many neurons and go and stimulate and see, can you have a consciousness arising out of it? And the answer is, we have not been able to do so. So where do we go from here? So from the Buddhist side, we know, we talk about there is a mental consciousness. We also talk about that there is a extremely subtle consciousness which goes from one life to the next. But to a neuroscientist, uh, that will not be acceptable because we really don't know how to deal with it. However, even though we might differ philosophically that whether there is a mental consciousness or an extremely subtle consciousness, but we can still have a dialogue. And dialogue could be based on that what we can learn from each other by designing better and better experiments to map the consciousness. 
and that's the direction I'm going to take you now and talk about what is feasible even though we might differ on the philosophy side on many points. So uh, I will take you, first thing is that perception of time. Now, uh, the reason I'm going into time is because in Buddhist texts, often we talk about dura duration of a moment and what a thought duration of a thought might be. So I might share some results with you which might uh, give you a one way to collaborate. And so here what I'm showing you, a picture of the uh, brain, and in that, uh, uh, the middle portion of the brain and the bottom portion, the one in purple color, uh, is really responsible for time. And so like uh, in a normal brain, time we will perceive in a normal way, but suppose uh, brain is slightly injured, or brain is, uh, say you take some drugs or something, perception of time could be very different. So the perception of time often depends some tissues in the brain, how it is uh, reacting to particular chemicals, what is going on. So now I will take you uh, how we can measure time nowadays, which might relate to duration of a moment. So let's assume that you guys are all expert in science and you know how to do EEG research. So here I'm showing you a picture of a person who has about 256 electrodes on the head and we can measure in a good way what the brain is doing. The layout out of the electrode is given in the middle here and the top of the nose will be here and so after measuring the EEG we plot the data. And here I'm looking something called phase. So like how the phase of EEG is changing. And, uh, and we can relate this to different part of the brain from the top looking. So I have just put a small uh, circle or ellipse, which uh, generally will be the area where language's memory uh, is mapped in, the, in these pictures. So we collected the data of one person to see how the phase of uh, this person's brain activity is changing. The top portion shows those plots uh, when the person was just sitting normally, not doing anything. The bottom row shows person we asked to do some meditation, very simple type of meditation. Uh, and so here in these pictures, the red color means that the brain is very active. Blue color or light blue color means that the brain is less active. And now, now let me guide you through these pictures. So here you see uh, brain is doing something. Here brain goes into low activity. Then it comes back more active, more active, and then it becomes less active. So what it means is, if you go from low activity of the brain, uh, then high activity and then low activity again. So what it means is, in general, the brain is sort of doing it sick, then it flips into a very low energy state. And that is what is known as a transition. Brain goes from one transition state to another and it keeps going it. And this is a very natural process. Now just memorize the number. Here, a normal state, the transition is about 12 milliseconds or, or 0 0.012 seconds. Uh, so that number will be important in the next slides. Now look at the bottom row of the pictures in which uh, you will see the person who is sort of doing meditation here in a active state and then suddenly a uh, person is able to go into very low uh, state of the brain activity and then slowly come back into higher activity. So what it means here is that 
a person has a capability to keep the brain in a very low stable state of activity for a longer time and then uh, a state then changes again and again and so what it implies here is if a person is doing uh, uh, meditation they can actually hold their brain at a very stable position for a long time and in this particular case the person was even though over us uh, just be in meditation but this area is still active so it's a definite possibility that language and memory area of that person was really thinking about something so even though brain activity has gone in a low state but person is able to hold some memory and it is continuing now now i will speculate for a moment is it possible the person might be visualizing an object and holding on to it while person is still into a stable state and so what does it all mean so one thing which means here is that uh, to us scientists that a person has a capability to control the activity of the brain and now if if we want to bring out some physics into it now you can say the mind matter interaction even though we may not be i mean ordinary people might not be able to move an object but at least we are able to control our brain by thinking about it by postulating about it and so this way it is possible that we can even control our breathing our blood pressure and those things so this is a one example of mind and matter interaction now uh, now how does it work hmm? oh my god okay i am running out of time so i may have to talk a little bit faster it is a possibility that at a quantum mechanical level we can control the cell functions which in turn will be able to influence our thoughts and vice versa so therefore mind matter interaction is possible now earlier i said to remember that normal phase transition was about 12 millisecond and now i will go to next slide and uh, here time in buddhism when uh, like looking at uh, from the vasubandhu's text we often talk about chana in sanskrit or moment in english they often write k s a n a but it is chana or a moment it is said to be about 13 milliseconds or 0.013 second and which is very equal to what we are seeing in the normal transition of the brain activity so these numbers seems to be very close by and uh, uh, similarly we can measure the when people looking snapping a pick uh, finger snap and those numbers also match up very well uh, so now these are some possibilities where more research can be done now i will <coughs> uh, jump into some another thing that from research point of view we are seeing that before brain does anything even if it is not planning on doing something often we see that brain is uh, begin to prepare itself to going to do an action anywhere between 1 to 8 seconds before it does anything so as an example let's say i'm sitting here and i'm going to move my hand i'm not thinking about moving my just uh, not doing anything just sitting there but brain on the other hand within between 8 to 1 second is already planning it is already cognizing that it's going to do and then we do it Uh, we decide to do it so what it implies is uh, that m- within the brain itself there is a precognitive process going on and uh, and brain knows ahead of time that it is going to perform an action so what does it all mean uh, 
Yes, in a way it is possible that brain sees the action before it happens. And so what are the possible explanations? May I have a little longer time? Just two minutes. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> All right, I, I need to talk faster. <laughs> okay, so now I have to jump into physics. Uh, in a way, quantum entanglement is one way which we talk about all the time. If the events are entangled, definitely it is a possibility to uh, plan before an event uh, happens. Now, the quantum entanglement also means that we are all connected. And uh, nowadays there are many proofs that quantum entanglement does happen. It's not like it is just uh, something which many physicists could deny, uh, while others might say it could happen. I will give you one example of quantum entanglement, which I mentioned yesterday. The cell phone nowadays, mobile phone, their antenna is actually based on uh, uh, this photon entanglement inside the cell phone versus the signal coming from cell tower. This is how the signal transmission is there. So that's possibility. Now let's jump into complex time. Now I'm going towards if the precognition is possible, what happens? Now precognition, not only in the brain, uh, if you believe Buddha ji, Buddha predicted many things which will happen in the future. So if you are looking for what might be the possible explanation, one way to look at it is that time itself is not a real thing, but it could be a complex quantity. So in real quantity, uh, events are well defined, but, uh, and that's where the causality comes in. But in, uh, I mean, imaginary time, uh, we don't have causality. So past, present, future uh, are not defined. So that's the one way to look at the time. Another way to look at time is, now this is a little more uh, controversial, but it doesn't mean that it is wrong. It has been postulated by uh, a, Indian physicist Sudarshan that faster than light uh, particles are possible. Uh, and so actually myself and some of my colleagues, we applied it to physics. If we travel faster than light, then space becomes time and time becomes space. And within that framework, like if two events are separated, but they are connected. So what it simply means is, uh, I will just take an example of a Buddha mind. So that type of a enlightened mind will know information about all the events at any given moment because the concept of past, present, and future is not there anymore. And so with these things we can, uh, uh, see that predictive capability of the mind is there. Now I will make uh, concluding remarks. Let's say, for example, we could collaborate. So scientists and philosophers, we need to learn each other's language. I would say neuroscientists needs to learn Buddhist philosophy or at least learn a little bit. And the uh, Buddhist philosophers, they need to learn some neuroscience. Then dialogue becomes very important and it can be done. I will even throw in some experiments. Uh, let's say you are visualizing an object. What portion of the brain you see the object is being visualized? Now go and um, get your EEG measured and see what EEG is showing. Right away you can prove two things. How good your visualization is and whether it works or not works. And I know in Buddhist uh, circles, there is a lot of uh, desire to measure thuktam, or like when a person goes into, uh, like towards the end of life, doing the final prayers, then uh, there are certain ways when the sub, uh, I mean extremely subtle mind is, is about to leave the body, how we can measure. EEG may be one way, but there may be a better way. 
uh, I mean, that mind has many capabilities. It could even make the body heat change. Using digital photography and sophisticated technique, we can even see the blood flow in the body all over through those techniques. If a person is in, say, in Thuktam, or even, say, is doing uh, Thuma meditation, there, without touching the body, I can measure these subtle changes, and that may be another way to measure, and that might bring one more way to bring neuroscience and the Buddhist philosopher together, even though we might not agree on many theoretical points, at least for now. And the main reason is, we neuroscientists, we are still very young. I mean, I'm old, but <laughs> neuroscience, is, neuroscience is very young. We have long ways to go. And we can learn quite a lot from great Buddhist philosophers. Uh, so maybe I should stop here now, otherwise I will talk quite a lot. Thank you, Thanivad, Thuchiche. Thank you very much, sir, for your very stimulating talk. May I now request His Holiness to respond to the paper? Experience. I remember clearly 1979, my first visit Soviet Union, then still Soviet Union there. I met some scientists. Then I mentioned uh, when I touched sixth mind beside sensorial consciousness, then the scientist immediately reject. That's a religious matter. <laughs> So uh, then, of course, later, even very recent, uh, meeting some uh, Western psychologist or I said a scholar about mind, when they use the word consciousness, only refer sensorial five sensorial level. sensory level consciousness. Uh, you see, I think it seems very very limited knowledge about. Uh, sixth mind or chit. Uh, 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 だ、だでべんじゃけ、しばなみし、しばなみじゃしゃけよれ。さてにじゅにゆきなばたどき。たゆきなばたさでべしょこんげしばじじとりよれ。どうせね。えにてたんね。たゆるれてあじれ。たこ
then this is we are, we are beyond the realm of the sensory experiences. We are bringing mental consciousness. We are bringing the mind. So the senses and the sensory experiences, perceptions bring in the information and in the mind's role is to start making interpretations and evaluations. That seems to be a basic understanding. So now it is clear that many of the neuroscientific findings in examining the sensory processes and their specific locations in the brain, that's pretty well mapped out. But when it comes to the mental consciousness, other than accepting the general point that it is somehow has to be related to the brain activity, but his holiness was saying that he would be, you know, he wouldn't expect one to find a specific location, location region in the brain where we can say this is the local location of mental consciousness. So it may be more complicated. One of my friends, a German, I think brain specialist, uh, Wolf Singer. See, he told me, uh, no, not just me, on occasion or meeting, the uh, whole sort of brain. You see, usually you see work, the interdependence. Yeah, in, in, yeah, in, in total interdependence, in a connected way. And he actually mentioned the there is no area on central authority which control brain. There's no such thing. So he mentioned Buddhist concept of anatma is more suitable <laughs> according to that. Atma is something center that's not there. <laughs> he mentioned. But in any way, there's something different question. So, so now, uh, as yesterday I mentioned, so yesterday, so yesterday uh, I saw was saying that he talked about the phenomenon of Tukdam, the, the kind of realized masters after death staying in a state of clear light. And also, so that's a phenomenon. And similarly, there are facts of individuals who can recall past experiences, of experiences of past life, which also is a phenomenon. One of my friend, now no longer, he also, you see, a genuine practitioner. Now when he, the sort of meditation experience reached deeper, deeper, then, Kasashi uh, said, Rawa, grosser level of mind become more deeper, deeper. Then more subtle mind become more active. So, and when his meditation, quite because of the when a bit successful, then that kind of experience, you see, actually happened. When that happened, the reflection about past life. So these are, there are persons who actually experience like that. So therefore, uh, still we need more further sort of, because of the, uh, exploration with uh, full with, with collaboration. Uh, collaboration with scientists, scientists. brain specialists like that. Then one Nizuji got a guy that Thomas with a gore and uh, two days as well and uh, the New Zealand youth. Kong Napoli with New Zealand Saji Liver Kudulia, Kong Shan in Yimishisha. ドムシュシャ。で、胸にね、漫画ね、シャツですね。で、ポンプで貼っておくことは、え、MG や、だがよ。おたてあんたセバラでしゃ。え、キャンズ、え、カルシェンジグリス。え、ニジミドンゴマ
so um, with respect to the Tutam phenomenon, there was uh, quite an unusual case um, a couple of years ago in New Zealand um, with a monk um, by the name of Kusho uh, Tutem, someone that His Holiness knew. And um, when His Holiness visited New Zealand, he had died just a few days before. And um, when he died in the hospital, and um, you know, the doctors after a day uh, told the attendants that um, although he's dead, but there seems to be something unique going on here, and we will leave it up to you um, when to take the body away or not. So the, the hospital authorities <coughs> were much more, um, much more understanding, and so the body was kept there for four days, and, um, but on the fourth day, um, one, according to one of the attendants, one thing they realized is that um, his left hand had moved and was holding the ring finger of the right hand. Now, this is a very intriguing thing, even from the Buddhist Vajrayana point of view, because according to Vajrayana theory, when death occurs, all the activities of the prana had really come to and cease, and particularly what is known as the all pervasive wind, which is the wind that is responsible for mobility. So, so, uh, so uh, this poses a problem because um, you know within the Vajrayana physiology and understanding of the relationship between body and mind um, one postulates um, five primary pranas and four or five secondary uh, winds and uh, so one of the five secondary winds is called oral pervasive wind that is responsible for the mobility, movement of the body. And at the point of death, all of these activities are supposed to have ceased. So, um, so which means only the clear light, the luminosity is remaining, but accounting for a physical movement on the basis of luminosity alone is again problematic. So even for the Buddhist, if this phenomenon is real, and if it has really happened, it poses a, a problem, a question as well. Nandava so there is also another phenomenon known as transference of consciousness, which is in the Tibetan uh, Indian in Indo Tibetan Vajrayana tradition. And there is a, a case in the 1950, uh, late 50s or early 60s of uh, a meditator, a, a practitioner, who was uh, you know, arrested and caught up in these struggle sessions that were quite popular at the time. And he was being led by uh, uh, you know, People's Liberation Army soldiers to the place where he was going to be you know, um, staged for the struggle session. So while they were 
you know, taking him on the way, he asked um, if he could be given a permission to just sit down quietly and do, you know, do a little practice. So they gave him the permission. He sat down, and right there, he did the transference of consciousness, and he was gone. So, which suggests that there is, for a yogi, you know, highly advanced yogi, the ability to use the mind-body connection, and through yogic practice, is able to make an impact. So these are phenomena that, again, uh, raises problem, you know, questions. Then, I want to share with you. You see, those uh, genuine practitioner, I think many uh, practitioner who spend many years, uh, 20, 20 years, you see, in Chinese gulag. Uh, and one of them, uh, and I met later many of them, you see, many of them, you see, t t uh, told me during their so prison life, they found best time for practice. And then one monk uh, who spent 18 years in <laughs> <laughs> now, stop, stop coming. <laughs> so, so and he told me uh, during 18 years, 18 years in Chinese gulag, he faced a uh, few occasions, he faced some danger. And I thought danger on his life. I asked, what kind of danger? Uh, his answer is danger losing compassion towards Chinese. They consider, you see, develop anger is very serious sort of danger. Uh, so they consider like that. As a result, you see, uh, those people, the, their mind, physically, of course, due to some sort of hard labor like that, and sometimes physical torture, so some difficulties, but mental level, very peaceful. So through training of mind, uh, and so sort of the uh, increase of compassion, that immense help uh, to keep peace of mind, and their life remain because of the longevity like that. So these actually I witness. Uh, so practice of compassion uh, is really very helpful for our own health. Suppose, I think, we may call a compassion, practice of compassion is a wise way of selfish thinking. <laughs> so practice compassion. You see, it appears, you see, sense of concern of others' well-being. But the result, you get maximum benefit. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, His Holiness, your suggestions and advice is very good, and uh, and definitely, uh, it, compassion it always need to be developed first. Uh, when I was talking about Thuktam and uh, even Thumo, uh, m my suggestion is that uh, measuring through EEG, we touch the body, it could dis be disturbed. But if we do it without touching the body, through, and and then it may be feasible to measure it and prove it, even though it is a long way to go to do it, but it can be done because there are many new techniques. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Nemo mi tu cime si vota, mi tu domu si ušas. E te le mengano la luce. E ne ma, tu ti vanno a cicchia, cioè, tu ti vanno a cicchia. Di loro non ti esce, mi tu ti vanno a cicchia. Di loro non ti esce, mi tu ti vanno a cicchia. Di loro non ti esce, mi tu ti vanno a cicchia. Di so there was a case of um, the death of passing of one of the former Gandhian Chiba, the head of the Giluk tradition in Drepung in Mungod and um when he was in the Tuktam state for on the fourth or fifth day, His Holiness then immediately instructed um, the Delek Hospital in Dharamsala, which has uh, a portable set of machines that have been left by Richie Davidson's team uh, to use this on Tuktam project. But it was just a small portable machine. So, uh, and they, some people have been trained how to use this. So, um, so His Holiness suggested that some people go down. So they went down and supervised by Richie from a distance. So they uh, put all the electrodes on Rinpoche's head. And Rinpoche was in this state for um, altogether almost 20 days, 18 or 19 days in this Tuktam state. So quite a number of um, recordings have been made. So later um, His Holiness was saying that he had conversation with Richie Davidson and Richie shared with his holiness that um, looking at that raw data, there seem to be sort of certain hints of signals, unusual. unusual, which at this point is very difficult to interpret or make any sense of, but they are very unusual, something that one wouldn't expect in a dead person's body. So, so the point is, his holiness was saying that there are opportunities where neuroscientists and Buddhists can really collaborate so that more kind of informed experiments and studies could be done on this phenomenon. Thank you very much. We'll take up uh, the other questions uh, during the discussion session in the afternoon. Your Holiness, I have been asked to highlight the salient points of the proceedings of the last two days. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes uh, to go through uh, what I've tried to recapitulate. I would first of all like to congratulate and thank Professor Navang Santanla and the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies for organizing this international conference on mind in Indian philosophical schools of thought and modern science. It is indeed a great honor to have amidst us His Holiness the Dalai Lama who is not only our revered teacher, but will undoubtedly go down in history as the twilight or renaissance of morality. In this 21st century of dialogue, as mentioned by His Holiness, it has become imperative to have an interdisciplinary approach and expose the younger generation to compassion, knowledge, and intelligence. The coming together of scientists and philosophers has enriched our understanding of mind, even though the nature and function of mind has emerged as a complex issue in the context of Indian philosophy. In the nine presentations, attempts were made to analyze the nature of mind, how it performs its emotive, cognitive, and cognitive functions, the mind-body relationship, how the different mental concepts such as atma, jiva, manas, Antakarana, Ankara, Chitta, etc., are interrelated, and the role played by mind in bondage and liberation, and the various methods available in different schools, such as Sankhya Yoga, Jainism, Buddhism, Nyaya Visheshika, Vedanta, Phenomenology, Psychology, and Neuroscience. However, I feel that in the heterodox school of Indian philosophy, the Charvak school was missing. In Buddhism, mind variously termed as chitta, mano, manas, and vijnana is not regarded as a substance, but is supposed to be the ground of consciousness as well as the abode of subconscious operations of mind. 
The three core features of consciousness are subjectivity, intentionality, and reflexivity. In other words, uh, the other schools of Indian philosophy, uh, generally we find the ground of consciousness is regarded as an independent and uh, known substance which is called Atma, Jiva or Purusha. The sole substance in some schools such as Vedanta, Jainism and Sankhya is regarded as conscious by its very essence. In Nyaya and Visheshika, consciousness is regarded as the contingent quality of Atma. The sole substance both relates to and liberates from the world through the mind. These schools use many mental concepts systematically which are different from Atma, but are necessary for explaining the so-called bondage and liberation of Atma. These concepts consist of buddhi, cognition, intellect, manas, mind, thought, ahamkara, ego, chitta, mind, antakarna, internal organs, and so on. Although Purusha of Shankhya has been accepted in the form of Sya Drashta in Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, the text defines the very core concept of yoga as cessation of the modifications of the mind, chitta vritti nirodha. The non-Buddhist schools attach great importance to mind when it deals with the question of bondage and liberation. Yet, from the ontological perspective, they regard mind as insentient. In Nyaya Visheshika, manas is regarded as an independent, insentient substance, which is atomic in size, whereas in Jainism too, manas is regarded as material, padgalika in nature. In Sankhya and Yoga, the internal organ consisting of manas, buddhi and ahamkara, is supposed to be the manifestation of insentient primordial matter called prakriti. In one of the papers, we also saw how Schrodinger denounced a basic illusion in an ordinary and scientific materialistic view of the world by deep assimilation of Indian philosophies that helped him to address the mind-body problem with no concession to either dualism or monistic materialism and creating a border, creating a broader view that encompasses science yet does not reduce to it. Last but not the least, we had a presentation on the nature of mind from neuroscience and physics perspective that was synthesized with the Buddhist philosophy to create an interdisciplinary approach with better tools to probe the nature of mind. Finally, in the discussions, several questions were raised such as the relationship between consciousness and matter, Nirvakalpa, Sarvakalpa perception, problems of translation, the learning process and artificial intelligence, mind and body problem, cognition, not to be seen as an act but a product, bridge between the transcendental and the social and the descent into the ordinary here and now, the role of unfocused consciousness as a witness to allow the flow to happen in one's life, and opting for a life of divinity with the experience of oneness of humanity. However, as a sociologist, I feel that certain questions remain for me, and I would like to, you know, pose those questions. Number one, how do we synchronize individual conduct with collective welfare? As we have the aporetic situation, aporia is a contradiction that cannot be overcome in society. So, is it the fate of modern society? Is there a possibility of a non-ambivalent, non-aporetic ethical code? The second question is, in the context of the information revolution, how do we generate stable human essence, as you know Heidegger would call it, especially in the age of artificial intelligence? and Fukuyama's post-human future. Number three, how does mind emerge from language, social interaction, and relationships? So for example, we talk in terms of an authoritarian mind, a democratic mind, or a compassionate mind. Uh, and the last question, 
what kind of things can we become aware of and what remains inaccessible and why is a general question to all. So, the philosophical and scientific task is not to close the circle, to centralize or totalize knowledge, but to keep open the irreducible plurality in discourse and deal with knowledge that not only informs but also heals and transforms and leads us to overcome suffering and perfect the human condition. Thank you.